Good morning, everyone. Since I don't know why they gave me this topic, <laughs> I struggled all week, you know. Me, Pastor Tony, have taken it. He's 46 years old in marriage. I'm eight. But okay, I will just trust the Lord to help. Uh, just bear with me. I will try to be very discreet. And I might um, deviate a bit from what Pastor Tony said on the issue of sex. So I've made that warning, so please don't don't think that we are fighting ourselves. That's how it is sometimes. Let us pray. Our merciful Father, we thank you for your blessings. Oh Lord, you give us the blueprint when you sent your son. And he displayed to the world the reason why you gave us this institution of marriage. He gave himself. He ensured that there was intimacy between him and his bride. He gave his word. And he's still giving his word, making it plain in Proverbs, in Psalms, in, in all manner of genre of writing. That every person in this body of his, we have some level of intimacy with him. Oh, help us to learn from him. Help us. We know, as Pastor Tony said, sin has come and destructed everything. But also, you've given us your spirit, that by it we can learn to get ourselves back to what it was in the beginning. Thank you, our merciful Father. Blessed be your holy name. For in Jesus' name we pray. Okay. I don't believe I'm doing, I can't believe I'm doing this. Um, cultivating spiritual in intimacy in marriage. Um, it, it's, it's quite tough because it's, it, it's something that should be very practical. It's something that you should, um, we all work in progress trying to ensure that we meet the mark of cultivating spiritual intimacy in marriage. It doesn't come by default on anyone. No matter how many years you've spent in marriage, you have to cultivate it. You have to work hard to ensure that spiritually, husband and wife, we have some level of intimacy. I must say that largely, many don't have that. Many in the church. Throughout the years, and if you read through um, history, you hear how people are so close, yet so far from themselves, even though they are married. Every aspect of Christian marriage must be spiritual. So there is no thing that, nothing like spiritual intimacy. Every aspect of a Christian marriage should be spiritual. And the intimacy also should be spiritual. As believers, our marriage must be ruled and governed by the word of God and the fear of God. And so whatever we do, and when it comes to, especially when it comes to being intimate with ourselves, it should be done to please the Lord and in the fear of the Lord. That's where we get spiritual intimacy from. If we are left to define intimacy on our own, we will all take sides. Our culture will tell us what intimacy is. Our environment will tell us what intimacy is. Intimacy will, be, will differ from the days of the Puritans, the days of the apostles, and our own day. But if it is ruled by the fear of the Lord, then it will be constant, anytime, any generation, anywhere. Marriage is more than the wedding day. Nobody struggles about intimacy on the wedding day. Marriage is more than the butterflies in the tummy. And the companionship between husband and wife should be beyond, you know, the, those days that we call the initial gra, -gra days, the, the first past for six months when you are in the honeymoon in Bahamas. Marriage is also about bad times. 
And that's where many fail. When we are in the good times, you think they are intimate. But then the Lord rolls in the bad times. And then people start to crumble. Marriage is about the pain, the hurt, the losses, the sacrifices, and most importantly, the need for constant forgiveness. This is what intimacy is about. This is what intimacy is about. Marriage is not, is not, is not kind of, people compare their friends to their wives. If, if you are, if it's that Eve is my friend and she offends me, I go home and I don't talk to her three days or I don't see her face in the morning, maybe before, 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 before noon or next week, I'll be fine. But I see my wife every day. And so it's beyond that kind of friendship. And sometimes when we are with our friends, we always bring our best foot out. But in marriage, we are who we are. You can't hide too much. You will soon be found out. And that's why many people, are, when they get married, first two, three, four months, they start to scream, I've made a mistake. You have not made a mistake. The day you put the ring in that finger, you didn't make a, make a mistake. You know, just have work to do. And there's no point backing out, out of it. So that's why I said, see, with all of this in mind, we must know that if we, our homes are not ruled, our minds are not ruled by, or governed by God's word, then we are going to be in trouble. The emotions, the feelings, all that is in, in, that's called intimacy, if it's not governed or, or overseen by the Lord and his fear, we are going to be in trouble. Intimacy in marriage must be spiritual, else there's nothing like intimacy. Because anything outside the fear of the Lord is, will be selfish intimacy. Many are spiritually divorced, even though they still live together. They're spiritually divorced, they divorce even though they go on vacations, they buy themselves gifts, and even consummate. What, they, what people, someone called it artificial intimacy. People live together, but they are barely patching through. People who are in marriages just hanging in there because of their children. People who are in marriages because of the money. So far, the money is flowing. And some are there because they just fear the Lord. They don't want to divorce. They remember Matthew 5 and, and all the other texts in marriage. They don't want to be divorced. They, they are fear, fear of the church. If you are that kind of person, you are in trouble. You are in trouble. So we must ask ourselves serious questions. Am I just hanging in there because God does not like divorce? Or... I am working hard at cultivating spiritual intimacy. The goal is not to hang in there. Do your bit, I do my bit, let's day our day. No. The goal is to cultivate intimacy with one another. Leave whole father and mother, cleave to your wife, become one flesh. 10 years, many have not achieved it. 20 years, they're still struggling. And you know, when we were getting married, we, we got all that thing about once the child comes, it will go away. No way. Why? And so, there's so much to talk about when it comes to intimacy. You can't really place the text and say, this is my text. But then I'll do my best to look at a few things. But then, there's also something that destroyed many homes. And Pastor Stalisi just waved it out. The marital bed. Sometimes, how do you know, to, to, to gauge people's spiritual intimacy, you have to check what happens at the marital bed. Some people, it is dead or one-sided. People go into the marital bed with worldly ideas, cultural ideas, and notions they get from the world, forgetting that even in that place, God has a say. And see, you cannot hide from God. The way God has wired us, I don't know if you guys know men, for example. You can't just, just make it happen. You can't just make the mitre bed good if 
you are not intimate. You can't. What you get is perhaps what you do with prostitutes. And so we must ask ourselves serious questions. So I'm going to be very discreet, try to hold myself back um, in saying some things. Read. Read the Puritans. Read um, some counselors, reformed people, and see how everything is intertwined together. It affects the marital bed. It affects. One is artificial intimacy. Um, someone said it, it, it is people who start their married life in the, at the early stage where you don't need to work too much to get the butterflies in your tummy. The first three months, the first six months, where things just happen. You go on vacation, your wife is all beautiful. They read song of songs, and it's just flowing. And without, with little or no effort, everything is fine. But then, one day, they wake up to reality of what they are in. And before you know it, that disagrega dies down, and the people start to blame themselves. The excitement and goose pimples of the, our early marriage are what people call artificial intimacy. It is because it is not worked for. It is not worked for. Just because you just my lady, brother, a sister, yes, there's so much excitement. But immediately you go deeper into marriage. A year or two, it dies down, rubber meets the road, and then there's trouble. And you start seeing couple start talking about shared task at home. It is your duty. It is the man that should do this. It is the woman that should do that. And not shared intimacy. People who don't lift each other's burden anymore. And now they start to blame. We remember that we are Adam's children. Because he also started the blame. We treat ourselves as teammates, not spouse. Do your bits, I do my bits. Both in finance and everything. Everyone knows their role in the home. Just like a job or when you're working with your colleague. And people move on. No one is kind to each other's burden or praying for each other's weakness. Empathy is gone, and then, like a football match, once the game has ended, everyone goes home. Spiritual intimacy is what many people, uh, sorry, artificial intimacy is what many people live on in our day. And we must wake up from that. The Lord Jesus Christ did not make us colleague, colleagues at home. Or, or teammates. We ought to be one. And you cannot wish the oneness. You must work at it. You can't complain all day about that person's weaknesses. And you forget that you ought to work to ensure that that weakness is taken away because his problem is your problem. Your problem is his problem. Look at what the Lord did, said to us in Ephesians 5. Talk with me. Let me go to the Bible now and let us see some text. The Lord is the one with the, big, the, the best picture of spiritual intimacy can be found in the Lord. Ephesians 5 from verse 25, look at what the apostle said the Lord did. Husbands Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the word, wash of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spots or wrinkle or anything, but that she should be holy and without blemish. I don't know if you got if you get the point. Whatever the Lord wanted the woman to be, he poured, him, he poured himself in it so he can get it. It's what you put in that you get out. You don't sit back and say, you should be X, Y, Z. And that's why even when I'm doing my counseling, I tell people, be, have very low expectation of your wife or your husband. And give yourself very high expectation. Have very low. Don't stop looking at my hospital three, men. Go and look at your own. The Lord 
didn't look at his weakness compared to the wife and vice versa. So I'm not hitting at brothers here. It's, we are both in this ship together. Spiritual intimacy is work. And here the Lord wants a woman that's holy, a church, without blemish. So what he did, he gave himself that he might sanctify her and cleanse her. And so if you say things are not working, it's your fault. Have you given yourself to make that work? If there's a breaking communication in the home, it's my fault first, even though she might, not be, she might be the one not talking. Immediately we get here, we, are, we will not operate in the team, like teammates anymore, your colleague. Have you done your shift? Let me do my shift. We are in the ship together. It goes down, we go down together. And that's intimacy. That's oneness. We strive together. 28, husband ought to, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. He who hates his wife hates his own flesh. And 33 said, uh, 32 said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Our Lord laboring on the church, labored on the church and continue to labor on the church until he, he get what he wants from the church. You know, this, 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 we make a big mistake before we marry. We think we found the perfect woman. And please, before you marry, don't just go and pick. Of course, in your mind, at least, let it be the perfect person. But once you step in, the work has just started. We must cultivate and fight to get that oneness. And we must see the example here given to us by the Lord. Intimacy is not, it's not dropped on our laps. No matter how, how strong your friendship was when you get, before you guys got married. Once you are married, it's a different ball game and you must work at it. Husband and wife. And so when you see two people come together before you and they start to point figure at themselves, you just laugh. She points one, or he points one, force pointing back at the person. Immediately we start to live like this, we must. We, we will see that we will start to cultivate this spiritual intimacy. Look at John 17. And this is the Lord also trying to show to us what he, he does to ensure that all is bride. And I'm using that word carefully. Every one of us who are part of this bride of Christ is sorted out. John 17 from 19 to 21. For them I sanctify myself. That they too might be truly sanctified. You see how the Lord gets the church sanctified. He sanctifies himself. You can't sit down. Whatever it is that you are, you are looking for in that marriage, it can't come to you on the platter of gold. You give yourself to get it. Spiritual intimacy is work. Read books. Read blogs. Ask people. Blame yourself for that person's failure. I say so. And look at what the Lord did. For you who, have, who were not there when he was saying these things, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me, who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, just one, Father, just as you and me, and uh, you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, that the world may know that you have sent me. And you see what the Lord was striving at. His, the standard is so high that he's striving at the kind of communion him and his father is, are, are having. So he, Christ is not trying to take you and put you behind him while, while he's with his father. He's trying to take you and bring, him, bring you to that relationship, that communion, that level of communion that he had with his father. And so... What you get is what you have put in. In your homes, in my home, is what I have put in. 
if I've wasted my time watching TV, going out, going out, hiking, doing all manner of things, enjoying ourselves, thinking that that would bring intimacy, and that's part of it also, if you have the money. If that's all you do, whatever you think you are doing, the result is what you are putting. So if you want to measure how much work you are putting into your marriage, what are you getting out of it? That's it. There are aspects of spiritual intimacy in marriage. There are things that make um, people intimate in marriage. And this, I'm going to mention just three, many, but three. And these three, if we can look to those, these three, and we'll see that they are not far from what most of us might be thinking also. What drives or enhances spiritual intimacy? Number one is growth in grace and the knowledge of God. Spiritual intimacy is driven by spiritual mindedness. Being of one mind is the only way to grow intimately together. And so if you are growing, Lord, and she is regressing, or vice versa, there's no way you guys can grow spiritually intimate. There's no way. There's no way. So that first knocks out, for those who are not married, my an unbeliever. You are in trouble. You have entered trouble. You can't dare not say, dare say that you want to marry an unbeliever. You have set up yourself for destruction. And you think you convert the person. You are in trouble. Second Corinthians 6, verse 14, Apostle Paul said, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And look at why he said so. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? For what communion has light? With darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belia? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? So, when they are saying, Don't mind an unbeliever, they're just saying, You die. What has light got to do with darkness? And so, that's for unbeliever. But if you are in the home and the husband is growing, or the wife is growing, and the husband is not growing, the, the, the partners are not growing together, there will be trouble, it will be lopsided. And you will see that you will be the one causing trouble in the home. There's a text Pastor only read, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, that talks about uh, sex. And it says they can only stay away from sex based on what? Mutual consent. Now, what that means is if one say no, the other will not go. Mutual consent means we both agree to stay away from sex. For a while, Abby. But if one say no, what are you going to do? And so, if you have, if you are growing together and you want to pray, or you are spending more time, or you want, you are spent for the Lord, and that's taken away from the home, and she says no, or he says no, what are you going to do? You can that text convicts you, and you say, oh Lord. Perhaps you've married an unbeliever, one or two of you are not growing together. The consent should be because two of you are growing, two of you understand the need to stay away, to pray, to do the work of the ministry, to trust it over something. That's why there will be consent. There's no consent, meaning two of you must agree. You can't bully him or her to say, can't you see I'm praying? You can't. And that's what many of us do. We just move. But because we lose sight of the first thing we should be doing, we should first be ensuring that we are both growing in grace and knowledge. To cultivate spiritual intimacy, you must ensure that your wife is growing and your husband is growing. You're not competing. You need her to grow. You need him to grow spiritually. For so that you can be on the same page. You can't stay at home or he stays at home and you are in church and say, she's delaying me. Cry to the Lord to drag him or her. You can't grow. And this, I mean, we who are ministers and church workers, we need to learn. 
We have to. And I'm not talking about people knowing the works of Calvin and they know the works of John Hoss. No, no. Growing spiritually. Know the Lord. Have affection for the Lord. Understand the things of the Lord. Want to please the Lord. So the first thing that drives spiritual intimacy is growth. Growing in grace and the knowledge of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 2. Verse 14 and 15. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but consider them foolishness. You get the idea. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit, but consider them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The natural man. The one that is carnally minded. So while you are giving, giving him or, your, or her, your rev, to her or to him, is foolishness. It's foolishness. Because two of you are not on the same level, or at the same level. And so we have that duty to ensure that we are both growing in the home. Spiritual intimacy will be difficult for those not growing in knowledge of Christ, whether it's both of them or one of them. Cultivating spiritual fellowship requires sharing spiritual experiences, spiritual concerns, triumphs, failures together. When couples are spiritually intimate, they provoke one another to good works. They don't pull themselves back. They push themselves to go. If he goes, I will go here. If he's there, I will read more. You are stirred because your husband or your wife is now doing X, Y, Z in the church. Say, so what am I doing? Because you get to a point when she's the one that's supposed to mind, for example, you say you want to eat, and she has to give you food, and then she comes back home. There will be problem. There will soon be problem. The two of you are not the same level. We must ask ourselves serious questions. And these things are visible in the church. You just see a couple. One dresses like, let me pick maybe the woman, dresses like Beyonce. But the husband is like uh, Enoch. Or flip it aside. The woman is like uh, Catherine Voss. But the man, John Cena. <laughs> yes, I'm just using, I don't, want to, I don't want you to visualize anybody in the church. I'm just, I'm just using names. But you get the idea. You can clearly see that these people are not together. They are not at the same pedestal spiritually. Right from the dressing and the way they raise their children. And you can see there are some struggle. The, the, the husband might be, just, might be very pious in his dressing, but the, the children are just flashing. Like, is it from this guy's home or this lady's home? There can be confusion. But there is confusion in the church. And we can all see it. But the two of them are not the same page. It's worse if it's the man that is struggling. It's worse if it's the man that is struggling. It's worse. And so, you want to grow or cultivate spiritual intimacy, you must ensure two of you are growing spiritually. If like, buy her or him a jet, he can't make up for it. The day she wants to fly that jet to the Bahamas, you want to do BCM. There's trouble. There's no more jet now that will solve your problem. I don't care how much money has come to the home. If you're not growing together, there will be trouble. Your desires are not on the same thing. And you have difficulties. The second thing is communication. To what drives spiritual intimacy. I think I have like 15 more minutes. 
Intimacy is hinged upon communion, com communion and communication. And right from the fall, man withdrew itself from one another. We don't communicate with ourselves. For some people, even the basic communication of talking about what happened at work that day, they don't talk. Mm, 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 everywhere. They can't talk about even what happened on the road. And so, how would they start to talk about more intimate things? If you can't even share who bashed your car. How? And so, communion is one key thing. And then we go back to the Lord again, Ephesians 5. You see how the Lord drove the intimacy he wanted to have with the church. Ephesians 5, verse 25 and 26. The Lord ensured that the woman became sanctified, the church rather, sanctified and cleansed by the washing of, the, of, of water by the word. Communion is very vital. If you don't communicate, you are going to be in trouble. Throughout the Song of Solomon, all you see there are words, intimate words used to ravish the heart of the Sholamite woman. We all like that part. But also, those words, they are also words used to express fears, losses, disappointment. Talk, brothers and sisters. If you don't talk, you know those days they tell us, you, you, you don't want to tell your wife you love her. But say, you know, you know I love you now. Say it. <laughs> That's why Twitter is 140 word. It's just tweet. It's talk. We don't talk. We don't talk. And we expect, sisters also, you expect the man to read your mind as if he has, he has he's become a, someone that has a crystal ball. Speak. Communion. Man and woman. Song of songs, all manner of things. I don't want to read. I have just uh, limited time. You see all that he said. Beautiful word used to describe his affection towards his wife, the, the woman, and even when he was when he lost the, the beloved, all were words. The Lord used words, different genre words to communicate to his church, and we are meant to communicate back to him in words through prayer. Spiritual intimacy grows when you and your spouse are able to express yourselves without fear. You can share your weakness, your fears, your anxiety. You can share how God is dealing with you, with your sins. You can share with your wife. You don't prove macho before your wife. You are naked and not ashamed. And that's why they can, we can pray for ourselves. Mention your sins to your wives and your weaknesses. Share your growth and struggles with your spouse. You see why the first, one, like first point is important. If you're not growing together, it doesn't make sense when you are saying, I can't pray. She had not prayed for two weeks. Of course, when you say, I couldn't pray for yesterday, you say, oh, oh God, I've not prayed for two weeks. You, you would just look at you and say, you are trying. But if two of you are growing, and when you are now struggling, you can easily say, pray for me. I've not prayed for a day or two. Oh, she will feel it. But if she has not prayed for two weeks, first she will tell you, hurry, 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 let's go. Teach your prayer yourself. Or he. Someone said there are three types of communication. The first one is talking about the happenings around, uh, that's the first level, the lowest level of communication. Talk about the weather. Talk about, the second one is talking, talk about us. Talk about us is our plan. Where are we going to build our house? Are we going to move to Lekki? How many children are we going to have? And all that. But the, the highest level is talking about our feelings. See, you can talk about how your plans, you can do everything, and you see, don't let your husband or your wife know how you feel. How many women tell their husband how they feel after they finish from the marital bed? How many are able to tell their, their husband and wife the truth? For how they feel. And you think you are married. You are not. You are struggling. I'm not joking. 
So first level, second level, you must ex- read songs of Solomon and see how they express themselves. Oneness means nothing to hide, even the most sacred thing. Nothing to hide. I can't read that portion. You will borrow me 10 more minutes, Brother Peter. The last one, which is a bit controversial and I have to be discreet, is sex. There are many more, but I'll just pick three. One is growing together in grace. Two is communion. Three, sex. And this one has a very important place in intimacy. We're talking about intimacy here. This is where your godliness, the first one, and your communication is tested. Spiritual intimacy finds expression on the marital bed. It's like God has wired in such a way that you cannot hide. You can hide many things, but when you get that point, you can't hide. You cannot hide if you are a brute, if you are unkind and selfish, you'll be found out most likely on the marital bed. The proper use and place of sex helps us develop and promote spiritual intimacy. Now, the Roman Catholic have a very different view of sex and uh, the early church fathers. They, They think it is majorly for procreation and to avoid sexual immorality. But the Puritans rejected it. Calvin, Luther, and all, they rejected it clearly. Puritans viewed it as a gift of God and as an essential and enjoyable part of our marriage. William Gouge. He said that husbands and wives should cohabit with goodwill and delight, willingly, readily, and cheerfully. William Perkin said, they do err who hold that the secret coming together of man and woman is with sin. Because the, the, the Catholic said that it's sin. So that's why they promote uh, celibacy and all that. Except for procreation. And you see, some of us are at that point where at best it's just for procreation. It can be so. Let me, let me read what Pekin said. And Pekin read what Pastor Nye read out today uh, from 1 first, first Corinthians 7 3. William Pekin said, Marital sex is a due debt or a due benevolence, what Pastor Nye said, that a married person owes to those, to their spouses, that debt they must pay, he says, with a singular an entire affection towards one another. And they must pay it in three ways. First way, the rightful and lawful use of the body on the married bed. Secondly, there must be physical intimacy that is used in a holy and undefiled manner. Hebrews 13, 4. So as I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about all the wild things going out there. Talking about spiritual intimacy governed and overseen by the fear and the love and the word of God. But you can't exclude this. And then the fruits of God honoring enjoyable sex in marriage are the blessings of children, the preservation of the body in cleanliness, and the reflection of marriage as a type of bond between Christ and his church. But he gave a warning. Like Pastor also said, though Puritans honored sexual, sexuality of marriage, they did not reduce marriage to sex. Rather, they maintained a view of marital love as broad as life itself. Marital love must fill every room of the home and spill out into the world. Marital bed is given in marriage to forge intimacy. A healthy and decent sexual life will surely promote spiritual intimacy in marriage. We cannot downplay this part. If you downplay it, you will struggle. The covenant of marriage is not complete without the coming together of the man and the woman. And 
It's the sign of you saying I do. Just like any time there's rain and the rainbow comes, a sign of God's promise, a covenant that will not destroy the world. That's what it does. Anytime a man and a woman come together, it's a sign of what God has given. The pledge of oneness. And so you ask yourself, when we come together, does it reflect oneness? Or just one-sidedness? So these are questions we must ask ourselves. Intimacy has a lot to do with this one. Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore a cane, and said, I have acquired a man of the Lord. Genesis 4 verse 1. Adam knowing his wife is not about knowing the color of her hair or her favorite food. I hope you guys know. It is knowing her intimately, which includes knowing how to please her. And this one is not only for the men, but I think it swings more to the men. We have the task of knowing our wives. We have that task of knowing our wives. One of the biggest sins committed in marriage is found in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. Pastor Neil also read this text. And I'm just going to zoom on the word. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5 said, Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time. The word deprive here means steal or defraud. Many defraud their spouses by not ensuring that they have mutual benefits or satisfaction on the marital bed. How long are you going to go on with that? You deprived, you steal from your wife or your husband. If at any time you guys come together, you are the only one that I enjoy. You are stealing. You are sinning. And we must see it that way. We must see it that way. And then alone can we start to be like the Lord who gave himself. You must ensure you do something. And you can't cover it up with prayer and Bible devotion. No way. In fact, Joel Bikke said, spiritual intimacy is not prayer and devotion. Say, prayer and devotion helps. But mm, it is vulnerability before yourselves. This is who I am. I'm struggling, you say to your wife or your husband. And two of you work at it to ensure that you become one. Nobody comes out of the room feeling cheated or used. So we have a Mount Everest before us, and we must climb it. And so that's why it's called spiritual intimacy. We must trust the Lord. We must dig deep into his word. We must ask him to help. We must be open, naked, not ashamed before our spouses to seek help. My brother and my sister, these three things are essential. Growing in grace communicating, and then the marital bed. We can't grow spiritually intimate with ourselves without ensuring we sort out these three. And they are all intertwined. No communication, the other two will not work. No growth, the other two will not work. You can't say, oh, you, you, you know how to do whatever you want to do. And you're not growing, you're not communicating, it will not work. God has wired us in such a way that the three variables must be present for us to have a healthy, spiritual, intimate home. Now, we are sinners, we are fallen, we are sick, we need help. Yes, we know. But at least know the standard. Then go after help, look for help. And two of you go hand in hand. It might take you five years to resolve your issues, but then it is even in resolving those issues that you get more intimate with yourself. Two of you are working out getting this thing done. We are trying to, you might grow up in a home where people don't talk. You're always to yourself. But then once you, you know, um, Jim Newell once said, if you know you want to do ministry and you just want to, you don't want to work, 
just want to live your life and just go all out. I said, don't marry you. The day you marry, you must care for your wife. That one just strung bam bell in my head. So I went to start me to clean. <laughs> you have to. There are consequences for every action. If you are married, the consequence is you must give your wife or your husband what is due. You can't defraud him or her. And there's no escape route from this. And it is in trying to resolve these things that you become bonded to yourself. It is not wake up, marry, and you're perfect. It is in resolving these issues. I want to make sure he's growing or she's growing. Then you pray more for the person and you're checking on the person. I want to talk more about not only the car that was bashed or the house you want to build, but your feeling. The sermon that just was preached yesterday, talk about it. Critique the sermon. Oh, get what you learn. Talk about your sin. Oh, you know, I've been having some bad thought lately. But again, God has helped me. He knows you. She knows you. And then all that will flow into the mitre bed. And you can now walk at your pace. And God will help. Let us bow our heads and pray. A merciful Father, thank you for your mercies and grace and how you have wired us in such a way that we cannot hide. We cannot do one and neglect one. Help us to truly learn from our Lord who gave himself, ensured he gave himself to get what he wants from his church, from his, from, the, from, from his bride. Oh, that each wife or husband here will give of themselves that they might see the results presenting to themselves a bride or a groom or a husband and a wife that is God glorifying. Especially, O oh Lord, when it comes to the area of growing in grace, help us. Help us that we will pull ourselves, we will provoke ourselves into growing in grace and your knowledge. Help, O oh Lord. The homes, O oh Lord, we, people will speak to themselves. They will have best friends among themselves and not speaking their secrets or their, their fears and anxieties to their friends outside the church or in the church. Oh, that couples will open up to themselves, husband and wife. Help, O oh Lord. Be with us throughout this my seminar. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.